your cybersecurity solution is here. Introducing Pentester's Advanced Cybersecurity Suite. Ready for peace of mind? Try it for free. No credit card required. Pentester.com. gangsters um if you like my content please hit the subscribe button and ring the bell and don't forget about my patreon channel i got a lot of new content on there um membership start at a dollar um so check that out also don't forget my store father's day's coming i got these nice form gangster hats i have some fat andy t-shirts and mugs and some other stuff you know uh, check it out maybe you want to buy a father's day gift for next sunday um so Check that out. Um, so I just want to touch on a couple of topics real quick. I'll be in Tampa next week. Uh, if anybody's interested, contact us. Anybody in Tampa, everybody's interested in having a meet and greet, just, you know, reach out to us through my website. Um, and uh, we'll try to accommodate you in Tampa. I'll be there for, um, I'll be there Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. So, uh, you know, get in touch with me. The week after that, I'll be up in New York. I'm going up to New York on the 26th to do a mob tour. We're going to do uh, Manhattan. We're going to do the Ravenite. We're going to do Sparks. We're going to do um, a couple of other spots. We're going to do the building, actually, where they had the ceremony where my father, Fat Andy Ruggiano, was actually made. It's still there. It's by the 59th Street Bridge. We're going to go past that building. Um, we're going to do St. John's Cemetery, where they're all buried. Um, so if anybody's interested in, 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 uh, in catching that, uh, like I said, get in touch with us. Um, and we'll try to accommodate you. John Gotti Jr. going to be on Brenner, I think the guy's name. I don't know if he's going to be on the podcast as a guest or he's going to have a podcast with him, but it's coming out on June 12th. I think they're going to put a little segment of it out today or tomorrow, like a little trailer today or tomorrow. Um, I'm curious to see what he has to say. Um, I hope it's about positivity. I'm sure he's going to get a ton of views. I'm sure he's going to... Um, Talk very bad about John A. Light, um, Mikey Scars. I'm sure he's going to talk really bad about them because they both testified at his trial. I, I don't really talk much about them. The guy he's outside of John, you know, they uh, Angel is always cursing me. You know, I don't know why we used to be great friends. I don't say nothing bad about her father. I mean, he was always good to me. I mean, I know they got upset when I went out to see Sammy, and you know, when I befriended Sammy. But, you know, Sammy, I knew also from the street and, you know, um, you know, uh, nothing but good has come about my relationship with Sammy the Bull. So, you know, um, I have nothing bad to say about Sammy. Nothing but good has come about my relationship with him. Nothing but good has come about my relationship with a lot of guys that are on YouTube right now. I'm looking forward to hearing, hearing his podcast. And uh, I'm sure he can't talk much about himself because, like I said on an earlier show, the guy doesn't have coverage for any of the crimes he committed, and he committed some serious crimes. So he has to be careful about talking about himself, just like Joey Molina has to be careful talking about himself because Joey Molina still thinks he's a gangster with a podcast. So, you know, uh, they got to be careful. And uh, we'll see what happens. Oh, one other thing I want to talk about. This is none. I just forgot. I'm looking at the picture behind me and I realized. So someone posted a picture on Facebook the other day of um, John Gotti Sr., John Gotti Jr. And I believe it, it's one of John Gotti Jr.'s children uh, in John Gotti Sr.'s arms. And behind him is a portrait similar to this. <laughs> uh, uh, so I'm going to I'm going to tape a show that's going to be on Patreon about my relationship with John Gotti Sr. and this portrait behind me, how it ties into the portrait in this picture with Sr. and Junior and the baby. So people once and for all will know that when I talk about Sr., I know what I'm talking about.
So that show is going to be taped. I'm probably going to tape it next week in Tampa in the studio because I want it done well. I want I want it to be like nice and professional. And um, so I hope uh, people uh, um, check it out once I once I edit it and, and, and release it. What was your relationship with Junior? It was friendly. You know, we weren't buzzing buddies. You know, we were respectful of each other. You know, um, you know, it was good. It was all right. I mean, I never did any business with him. I mean, I did business in fringe bet business with him. You know what I mean? Um, I never really hung out with the guy. You know, I never hung out with him. I saw him all the time. Whenever I went to 101st Avenue, you know, the Bergen Fish Club, he would be there. Um but uh, it was it was it was respectful. It was you know I, I respected him. He I felt he respected me. We had a couple of beefs. You know, um, there's a story I got to tell about this guy Johnny Halpin and and a property that Junior owned um, about a, um, they want about an eviction. Um, and that's another show. I'll, I'll t another story I, I'm holding back on, but I will be telling that story soon. But uh, other than that. I had a you know a respectful relationship with him. Um, yeah, you know, we, we, I had a respectful relationship with him. I mean, I was more, I was definitely closer to his right hand man at the time, John A. Light. You know, I, I mean, uh, John A. Light. If it wasn't for John A. Light, Junior would have been 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 nothing in the street. I mean, John A. Light did everything for him. I mean, you know, he could say whatever he wants to say about John A. Light, but John A. Light definitely was his, uh, was, was his guy. You know, he could say anything he wants now about John, but John was his guy. You know, John did all the dirty work for him. John, you know, did all, committed all the acts of violence for him. Um, so, but uh, I got a long go with him. When he first came onto the scene, what was that like? That's a good, that's a funny story. I'll, I'll just tell you real quick, because that's another show. So he was in military school. And then he started hanging around on 101st Avenue. And, you know, John A. Light and all of them, they had a little bit, they had a little crew, you know what I mean? They had a, a little crew of guys and uh, good kids, you know. And um, I never even knew he got proposed. And then one Christmas Christmas Eve, we're waiting for Skinny Dom to come back from the ceremony because the Skinny Dom and Mikey Scars and a, and a couple of guys were getting straightened out on Christmas Eve. And uh, we were waiting, and in, in, I guess it was Christmas Eve of 88, I believe it was. Christmas Eve of 80, 1988. And we're waiting in Richie Gotti's. Well, I was, I was waiting on... 101st Avenue, and Dominic pulled up with Joe Watts, I think, a matter of fact. And that Skinny Dom was walking across 101st Avenue, and we were walking around towards the to go to Richie Gotti's Cafe, which was around the corner by the L. And then Dominic pulled up, and we hugged and kissed Dominic, Skinny Dom, and we congratulated him. Because, see, I just came from the ceremony. John Gotti Sr. was in Richie's club because he didn't do this. I didn't know why... He didn't do the ceremony, and I was wondering what John Gotti Jr. Sr. was doing in Richie Gotti's club and not performing the ceremony. Um, I, 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 I didn't know the reason yet. Then now we're all sitting in Richie Gotti's cafe, and the kid walked in, Jr. walked in, and everybody jumped up, hugging him and kissing him. And then it dawned on me, and I leaned over to Tony Lee, and I said, did they straighten out Jr.? And he goes, yeah. And that's when I found out he got straightened out that night. I had no clue he was getting straightened out. He was a tough kid, but he wasn't a criminal. You know what I mean? Like, it's hard, how do I, how can I explain it? Like, I was a, not that I'm better than anybody, but I was a criminal. I was a criminal from when I was a teenager. Like, I committed crimes. You know what I mean? Like, I committed crimes, I, and I worked in number offices, and I worked in crap games, and I, I worked in sports offices. I hijacked trucks. I sold swag. I banged out credit cards. I had stolen car rings. You know, I was hands-on. People like him ain't hands-on, not because his father's the boss. My father was a boss, too. But, you know, um, you know, 
he was uh, he was smart. Don't get me wrong. He was smart when he was on the panel. Nikki Carraza used to tell me all the time that he was very intelligent, very smart. But you know, I, I'm curious to see what he has to say on this podcast, and then and then we'll take it from there. You know, we'll see what he has to say. I know one thing. I, I'm willing to take a polygraph test for whatever I say. I don't know if anybody else out there is willing to do the same thing. I just want to throw that out there. Raghav says, thanks for answering my question last time. I have a follow-up on that. You said you, ha if you had gotten clipped, your father would have taken out your murderers. If it was the other way around, if your father had gotten whacked and if you knew who did it, would you have followed your father's advice and not retaliated? Or would you have gone to war against an army? Would Tony Lee have joined you in this war? Would Gotti have joined you in this war? No, Tony Lee would have told me not to. Tony Lee would have talked me out of it because because Tony Lee felt the same way that my own man felt. You know that if anything happened to either one of them, just to forget about it, um, because you can't fight an army. And you know what? And I and and not for nothing, but a lot of most most. Uh, how could I explain this? So I know people whose relatives were whacked, whose relatives were made members that got killed. Not only didn't they retaliate, they became made members of the same family that killed their fathers and brothers. So in that life, it's I guess it's part of being accepted. You know what I mean? Like my father was a gangster. He was a murderer. You know what I mean? Like... um. And but um and, and I don't know so so like listen Anthony Bruno, okay he's uh in the Bonatas his his father was what got murdered it was one of the captains P.D. Red that got murdered with the Bananas right he never retaliated and he became a main member of the Bonanno family Tommy Rava's son never retaliated he became a main member of the Gambino family um I could you know I uh. Uh, Albert, uh, uh, um, Albert Gallo, right? Joe, crazy Joe Gallo's kid brother and his brother Larry, they didn't retaliate when Joe Gallo got killed and they were made members of, of, of the Colombo family. You know, Patty Mac's son, who wanted to retaliate, who talked about getting retaliate, got shot in the head. Never got a chance to retaliate. So, you know, it's that's the mafia. That's the mob. I'm gonna I'm gonna do more stuff with the letters. So actually, the letters were confiscated by the FBI. Oh, wow. I got some of them back. The ones I've been sharing, I got back. I'm waiting for the rest of them to come back to me because what happens is when the FBI has uh, confiscated stuff like that, when they're done using it. Instead of them returning it all to me at once, they sent it out to Utah. And they have a storage facility in Utah, out in, out in Utah. Wow. So now I'm in the process of getting the rest of the letters back. Um, so once I get all of them back and I have all of them that were written, then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk about the rest of them and, uh, and maybe eventually put some of them in the Mob Museum in Vegas or... You know, uh, just keep them for, you know, my family for keepsakes or maybe sell them a couple of them. I don't know. I have to see what the future holds. I think that would be so amazing if you submitted just even one. Because yeah. just let me say that with all the talk that goes on out there, what you're mentioning and what he might say and whatever, Junior, you humanized his dad when you talk about him, when yeah. you share your relationship with him. You you show that just because John Gotti was a vicious killer and your your father was does not mean they didn't love their children and they didn't have hearts and souls and that they were there they for were people. Human, and they, were, they were still human beings. Yeah. They just lived in a different way of yeah. life. And how we approached cops was we just approached them and offered them money or someone else or someone or, or a lot of times through connections to other people that knew them or a relative or another person that was doing business with them, or they would just come and blatantly ask us and shake us down. Like they would come and just shake us down and say, listen, you have a crap, you know, back in the day, you have a dice game here, you know, we want 500 a month. Otherwise, you know, we're going to shut you down. They would shake you down too. So there was a lot of different ways how, how, how to get to, how to get to police officers or any law enforcement back in the day. Today, 
today it's a different world out there. Today they don't, you know, it, it's not like it used to be. If you enjoy my show, please join my Patreon. Ask your questions live. And please uh, join my Patreon at reformgangsters.com. Hey, how are you? Good, how are you? <laughs> I'm okay. Um, oh, do you like my mug I have? Oh, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, one of the things I think people have, everybody, when they talk about Paul Castellano, talk about how, you know, he's a businessman. Obviously, he was. But I feel like people don't really know the extent of he was vicious and I, I feel like people don't know that and I what do you th like why do you think that is that's a really good question because I was just talking about that uh, uh, not too long ago people forget that he had no problem ordering somebody's death mm -hmm. I mean he had no problem having somebody killed you know listen people say well he didn't pull the trigger listen just yeah. he's still so if I if I tell you go kill so and so and you go kill them just because I didn't kill pull the trigger does that make me less of a murderer than you? I gave right. you the order to go kill. No, he was vicious. He was Sicilian, and that you know he was all time Sicilian vicious killer. I had no problem murdering people. I mean, his main crew was Roy DeMeo. They were butchers. They were his main mm -hmm. guys. They did all the hits for him. The Westies were all killers. They were directly with him. Um, he had no problem having people killed, just like Carlo Gambino had no problem having people killed. You know, like uh, Albert Anastasia was the high executioner. So my father's regime was Tommy Rava and Tony Lee and all them guys. They were Albert's killers. <clears throat> Excuse me. When Albert got murdered by Carl Gambino, who became Carl Gambino's killers? The same crew. Now, Albert's killers, on and on and on and on. You know, mm -hmm. Paul Castellano was a businessman, but he was also a killer. <clears throat> the difference between him and, excuse me, the difference between him and John Gotti was John. He John Gotti was a street guy. That's why John mm -hmm. Gotti got the mm -hmm. best of him. Mm -hmm. At the end, he, John Gotti was more of a gangster. That's why I believe John got the best of him. At the end of the day, John was the victor. Because Paul was a, was a businessman, but Paul would have had John killed. There's no mm -hmm. doubt about it. Well, he had a son-in-law killed, didn't he? <laughs> yeah. I thought so. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> and he gave orders, to, you know, well, he gave orders to, for people to be killed all over the place. Look how many people Sammy killed under Paul Castellano's mm -hmm. watch. Well, and it didn't, like, I remember seeing... Sammy talking on one of the videos because I like his channel a lot too yeah. and he was telling the stories about some of the hits that he had to um, admit to or had to go on his rap sheet but that he was just there he didn't even commit yeah. them and it, yeah. it, it feels like the same thing he's charged with them he's convicted for them he didn't actually pull the trigger but he was there right. yeah just like me I got I got indicted for murder you know I I, I drove the person person there to get killed. I didn't pull the trigger, but I still got charged with the murder, just like the guy that killed me. The guy that pulled the trigger and myself were charged with the same crime. Thank you. You're welcome. That was a good question. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, I had, I had two questions. It was kind of related. So I remember it's dangerous to date the relative or son of a wise guy, right? Or I mean the daughter, I mean the daughter of a wise guy. So you mentioned in one of them that you would at one point dated Jimmy Burke's daughter. Yep. So did I, yeah, I dated so I dated Jimmy Burke's daughter when we were first of all, we were teenagers. We were kids, 16, 17 year old kids. And I was Fatty Andy's son, so Jimmy Burke wasn't gonna kill me. And I was respectful. We were friends. But uh, you know, I, um, but uh I I didn't I never dated like Arneil's daughter Tony. I could have got with her and I never did. I could have got with other people's daughters and I never did. You know, there was um, out of respect for their fathers or out of respect for their brothers. Um, and there was no need for me to do that. You know, there was no need for me, for me to this. You know, it, it was like playing Russian roulette. You know, listen, when I was in prison, when I was in prison, my son, I called up my son. My son was probably... I would say maybe 18 or 19 years old, my son was. 
And I called up my son from federal prison and my son's thrilled. He goes, oh, I just met a nice girl. I really like her. She's gorgeous. She's a good kid and blah, 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 blah. He goes, you and grandpa know her father. So I said, who's her father? He said, Vicar Muso. I told, because they live in Howard Beach. I told him, don't ever talk to that girl again. Don't ever call that girl again. Don't ever go near that girl again. And just forget you even know her. Just ghost her and don't go anywhere near her. Because if you have an argument with this girl and she says you did something stupid to her, you're going to disappear. And there's nothing I could do. I'm stuck in here. Grandpa's in jail. I'm in jail. There's nothing we could do for you. Stay the fuck away from her. And he stood away from her. Yeah. See, well, and then following up on it, I was thinking with uh, with recovery and going to nightclubs and stuff like that, because it's it's it seems like you're a very gregarious, friendly person. You enjoy the 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 living the full life and everything. And back in the 70s and 80s going out. So, you know, aside from the issue of dealing with, say, addiction and using the, the drug, cocaine or drinking, what about dealing with either going to the clubs or staying away from them? How did that didn't you miss that kind of life? Yeah, so you know, when I first day? got when I first got clean in 1988, when I went to treatment in 1988, I relapsed three times that first year. And the re reason why I relapsed three times is because I did go to clubs in Manhattan where I didn't belong. After the third time, and I finally stopped for good in January of 89, for a period of, period of times, I stopped going to bars, neighborhood bars. I stopped going to discos or nightclubs. I would meet people in diners. Someone wanted to meet me in a bar. I would tell them, no, meet me in the Esquire diner. I would meet them in diners. I would meet them in parks. I would meet them any, anywhere. Like I had after hour clubs. I owned after hour clubs where I had vending machines in them or whatever. I would go, instead of me going when they were open seven in the morning or whatever, I would wait till they closed and I would go in when they closed. So I took precautions in the beginning. After a while, you know, I started, I, 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 I started going back out again, you know, um, but I didn't make it a habit and I, and I didn't stay with anybody that was, that was, you know, I wouldn't allow anybody around me with any cocaine. So I took precautions and I made a lot of meetings and, um, you know, I, I protected myself in the beginning. Thanks, Neil proposed Buddy at a very young age when the books were put in the mid 70s. Why didn't your dad do the same with you? Many guys proposed their sons at a young age, like Francis Gotti, et cetera. Why didn't your father do the same with you? My father, believe me, I had many arguments with my father in the 70s when the books first opened. He just didn't, he just felt he wanted me to wait. I guess he knew I was partying. I wasn't. You know, I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't, um, my dark days with, with the coke, with the drugs, well, 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 from like 83 to 88, those, those five years were, were like my worst years with that, with my addiction, those five years. Um, I don't, you know, he just felt I was too young. He, I guess he didn't want to put that responsibility on me in case I did get jammed up, you know, um. He just wanted to wait. I had a lot of arguments with him over it, especially when, you know, he started proposing other people like Nikki and, you know, and this guy started and then Buddy got straightened out. And a lot of people I hung with and drank with, you know, Ali Boy Persico, you know, Mikey Francis, you know, all these young guys that I would run into in the clubs in Manhattan were all getting straightened out. And I wasn't, I had some good arguments with my father, but he just wanted to wait. He just, he said there was no rush. I got, he used to tell me, you got me. You don't worry about it. There's no rush. You got me. He used to tell me. I'm curious on your thoughts. What do you think the biggest misconception is about addiction and recovery? The biggest misconception with people with the general population is they don't understand how hard it is to, to stop. Why mm -hmm. can't, why can't he just stop? Why can't yeah. she just stop? Look what she's doing to herself. Look what he's doing to himself. I don't understand. Doesn't he see what he's doing to his family? But no, no. The addict doesn't see yeah. what he's doing to his family. The addict is in a self-centered spiral. And the, uh, the, nothing matters. It's the next one, the next one, and the next one. That's the biggest misconception is with people, they don't understand how hard, hard it is for people. Listen, 
it's very few people recover. We're blessed. Anybody that's in rec very few people recover. A lot of people try, very few succeed. It's like smoking cigarettes. How many people can't yeah. stop smoking cigarettes? It's just uh, people just don't know. It, it, that's, that's to me the biggest misconception is that family members or people in general don't really understand how hard it is and uh, and they get angry, they get resentful. You know, why can't they, why can't, like my father's favorite saying was, I don't understand what's wrong with your brother. I don't understand. <laughs> After I got clean and my brother and sister were still using his, he would call me from prison and go, I don't understand. Why can't they just stop? Yeah. I mean, does that yeah, it's make not sense? that easy? Oh, yeah. 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 yeah I've it's seen it. I, I didn't understand myself how difficult it was until right. I saw it up close. It's right. And, and, and the problem yeah. today, the problem today with, with recovery today for the young generation, not for me, not, but for like the kids now that are coming into treatment, the problem that I see, and this is my opinion, the problem today is. Medical mal uh, legalization of marijuana. I don't care if hmm. it. it's a gateway drug. People could tell me all day long. Well, it's like it ain't like alcohol. Um, um, a lot of medications. There's a pill for everything. Everything has a hmm. everything has an alphabet. He's got mm -hmm. uh, APAD, DFC. Everything. Everything's an alphabet. There's a pill for everything. And the kids in recovery today think that well. Fentanyl is my drug of choice, but I'll, I'll just smoke weed. It oh. doesn't work that way. It doesn't right. work that way because we're not wired that way. So it, it, to, I, think, I think the legalization of drugs today are making it harder for kids to recover because uh, they think it's okay to take a hold of mind altering substance as long as it's not their drug of choice. And to me, the only way to recover is total abstinence from all drugs. That's you know, that's that's what I believe. That's the literature I read, you know, um, and I still preach 12 step meetings, you know, like uh, I think that's the way to go. Um, 12 step recovery is, is, is you know, it's proved it proved it's proven that it works. I mean, it works around the world. I mean, but uh, yeah, that's that's probably the two biggest misconceptions. It's OK to, to not as long as I'm not doing my, my as long as I'm not doing my drug of choice, it's OK. For the addict and for the public, it's like, why can't they just stop? I don't understand it. It's almost as hard to watch as it is, I'm sure. I'm sure it's yeah. much harder to stop, but it, it's difficult. Yeah. And I tell family members to go to Al Anon, go to Al Anon, go to Al Anon. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, at least give it a shot, go try it, you know, because um, you're going to meet people there like that uh, struggle with family members of addicts and alcoholics. So I, I, I tell people's uh, families always, I always, recommend Alan on and Alan on for family members just to go and give it a shot. Go to a meeting, see how you like it. Maybe you'll hear something that oh. will help you, you know. I didn't actually know that um family members could go. Yeah, it's a whole fellowship. Go to Alan. Yeah, I think I will. I think I'll check that yeah. out. Let I me mean, know how it turns out. Yeah. Yeah. Go I will. Al Thank go you. Online, Google Alan on and it'll pop right up and just go to a meeting. Oh. Yeah. I'll let you know how it goes. All right. Thank you. How did Fat Andy react to juniors getting made at such a young age in a short period of time? Sean Gotti Jr., nothing. You know, he listen, his father was the boss. I mean, you know, um, he reacted, you know, like, you know. Um, I'm not saying the kid didn't deserve to get strained. If he wanted to get strained, I don't know. I mean, I guess he wanted to because he did. I don't think his father did him a favor. I mean, look what happened to the kid. The kid, you know what I mean? Like his life got blown up just like my life got blown up. I mean, you know, he's in a better position than me because his father was the boss. So his father socked away millions of dollars. My father socked away nothing. You know what I mean? So, I mean, he, he's living in a mansion in Long Island and I'm in Florida. You know what I mean? Uh, you know, uh, not that I'm uh, I'm living in, I, I have a beautiful condo, but, you know, um, uh, you know, he, his father was the boss. What's the Gotti's the kids? What did they do to earn their money? What did John Gotti Jr. do to earn his money? Victoria, any of them. A light was bringing him shopping bags full of money. So somewhere you know, he kept and, and and Carmine the Bull, you know, he was a millionaire. Uh, Vicky Gotti's husband, Carmine, 
had junkyards. They opened up, a, you know, they had this. They took over businesses. They took over companies. The father had them. Uh, Angel's husband Louis was in a in a, in a union. He had a, he was making all kinds of money an hour in in a big union. So they earned it the old fashioned way, like that. I got gotcha. you. Yeah. <laughs> so I want to thank everybody for tuning in to Reform Gangsters. Don't forget, if you like my content, please hit the subscribe button and ring the bell. Also, check out my Patreon. I got a lot of new content. And don't forget about my store. Check out the store. A lot of nice Father's Day gifts at the store. ReformGangsters.com. Have a good night.